Hi, everyone, and welcome back to SCORE's podcast, Inside College Admissions. On today's episode, our strategic advisor, Peter Van Buskirk, is going to interview one of our high school counselors. Peter is the owner and founder of Best College Fit and brings over 25 years of experience to college admissions. He's also a contributor to SCORE's blog, so make sure you check out his work there, too. Now over to Peter for today's conversation. Welcome to Inside College Admission, conversations with college advisors about matters affecting the college-going process. My name is Peter Van Buskirk, and I am joined today by Jonathan Milan, who is a college advisor at Jose Marti Mast 6 through 12 Academy in Dade County, Florida. Welcome, Jonathan. Hi. Good to have you with us today, and, and we're very eager to get your perspective on how things have gone at your place at Marti for the, the, the last eight to 10 months. But before we get into that, help us understand a little bit about your school. Can you give us a, sort, of, sort of a demographic overview of, of uh, Jose Marti? Yes, absolutely. So when I began as a college advisor, the school was transitioning from a traditional middle school into a public magnet school. I actually attended the middle school back in the late 90s, early aughts. Mm -hmm. In seeing the transition from the school, I would have never pictured as a middle school student what the school would turn into. And what the school has turned into over the last eight years is a top 100 public high school, according to US News and World Reports. What we've seen a lot is that our students are breaking barriers by attending very highly selective to top tier universities all across the United States and graduating from them with little to no debt. Every year, our senior class continues to earn more and more money when it comes to merit and institutional aid from these universities. The students that we get, I would say 88% of our students are Hispanic students because Hialeah is one of the most homogeneous cities in the United States with a lot of the population being Hispanic, predominantly Cuban. So the school is a very rigorous school. As I stated before, there's been a transition from middle school to high school. Our first graduating class was actually in 2015. And then before that, in 2011, that's when we had our first ninth grade class and then every year we added a class until we had our first graduating class. So this is this is quite a, a transformation of the school that you once attended then. Definitely. <laughs> now and I appreciate that insight. About eight months ago life changed for everybody. Tell me what it was like in March and April for the, the learning environment that, it, as you just described, is certainly a, a very intimate learning environment, lots of hands on. Now the coronavirus appears. What started to happen in your campus? Luckily, we have a faculty who is very proactive, very tech savvy, and they understood that just because we're working from home doesn't mean that education stops. You can't ever replace in school teacher model where the students are around you and they're engaged in that dialogue and it's very hands-on. You're never going to be able to replicate that at home. But there are some facets of that education that you can use even through Zoom, lectures. You can have breakout rooms. You know, with technology, the access to information is everywhere. You don't have to go to school and open up a textbook or go to your locker to take out your books. So our school was really well equipped because some of these teachers were already using things such as Edmodo, email to communicate with students. They were using Remind, they were using Nearpod. So a lot of these educational, instructional technologies that started to become more popular as we entered through the pandemic, a lot of our teachers were very comfortable with it. Within our faculty, we are departments. They have PLCs, which are once a week. So there was a lot of dialogue and a lot of communication and a lot of that collaboration of what are you doing? How can I improve my instruction? Our students were very quick to adapt to that. Our district as a whole was able to give students devices to help them transition to this learning. When the school shut down, it was right before spring break. So that gave the leaders in the county an additional week to really plan how they were gonna roll out technology so that the students can use it to continue to get their education. So now are your students 
being instructed remotely now or are they back in school for part or all of a week? How, how are things working for you now? Great question. So at the beginning of the summer, there was an uncertainty of what was going to happen. Towards the end of the summer, I would say about mid-August, um, the school district decided that they were going to keep students at home learning remotely because of the infection rate in Florida was still very large and Miami-Dade County was a hot spot, um, not only in the state, but across the United States. Then I would say at the end of September, they made a decision that parents had the choice to either send their, the students back to school or to keep them at home learning remotely. So at my school, I would say it's filled to 30% capacity where students are going to school and getting their education while the rest of the students are learning remotely. So teachers are either at school teaching physically to students or they're at school teaching remotely just in the classroom. Now, how does this affect your connection with the students as they get ready to apply to college? Because for the seniors, the, the process doesn't stop or slow down. It's, it's, we're right on the verge of, of the heavy application season right now. And you know, some of them are working remotely from home. Some go to school. You have remote opportunities from home. H how are you connecting with these young people? So in the spring, it was a little difficult to wrap my head around how am I going to help these students because I'm used to being hands-on I'm used to seeing paper especially with um in the spring when financial aid documents come in from the students and their packages and then they may have done something wrong on their FAFSA so I would print it out and see it but without that access to paper I really had to think about how I was going to do it luckily Zoom has been amazing and we received a robust training from SCORE to be able to really catapult us into the following school year and allow us to set the tone of how we were going to advise students through the summer and into the fall. So having that training, having that time to really get to know the program and working with the fine folks at SCORE to answer questions and prepare for some of the intricacies of the college applications mm -hmm. and SCORE was able to integrate them very seamlessly. It really helped. Once I was able to talk to the students and help them understand how SCORE is not an application platform, it's a platform that's a one-stop shop where you can do research, where you can learn more about yourself when you do the youth science assessment, where your counselors and teachers are going to send documents using SCORE. The kids were better able to understand that. I spent a lot of my time in the spring inputting spreadsheets for SAT and ACT so I could get that historical context over the last four years so that my students could see at a school like Boston University or at a school like University of Miami or a school like University of Florida, what are the students based on test scores that are getting admitted and their GPA? Now, the test optional and on being able to test has thrown a wrench into creating a target likely and reach list. So that unknown factor has been a little difficult to wrap my head around, but I'm not the only person um, doing that. Everybody else is on the same landscape. So I don't feel like my students are at a disadvantage. In Florida, they are still requiring students to test for our public universities for Medicaid and for admissions. So everybody is still on the level playing field. And luckily we're able to offer next Tuesday an in-house SAT school day for our seniors. So they're gonna be able to test finally. So that last puzzle piece is gonna be there. Uh, another thing I wanna add is that with me being at school, it was so much easier for students to just pop in and ask me a question. So in, me not being there and them not being there every single day, I've had to use things like Google Drive and I've had to upload files into the drive and score so that the students can click on it and then they can get to a document that gives them a step-by-step -step of what they should be doing as far as the college application season and now with FAVSA opening up. So I've created recordings of myself going through PowerPoint where they have the access to it whenever they want. Sounds like you're, you're evolving in your situation into what many will regard as the new normal 
and that the SCORE tool is, is a, becoming a very effective uh, assist for you. And yes, yeah, SCORE could not have come at a better time. I, I'll be honest. <laughs> well, and, and it also sounds like your population is particularly well suited given the predisposition toward the technology and the way Jose Marti has already set up students to have a, a certain reliance on the technology. I'd like to talk just a little bit about the testing for a moment, because as you said, there's a lot of angst in the process about tests for any student, any time. Uh, now, in the last 10 months, there's been a growth by 60% in the number of colleges and universities that have made tests optional for students in the process. And in fact, when interviewing deans of admission back in the spring, would ask them about this. And to a person, they said, well, we can't hold students accountable for information they really couldn't put together for a six or eight month period. For your students who are looking out of state, and I would imagine you have a fair number who are, what is their reaction to this test option? Do they, do they look at it with skepticism or do they embrace it? How are they seeing that so far? Test optional is not a term that is foreign to my students. I've been able as the college advisor and starting with the initial freshman class to look beyond your public universities within your county and within your state. Let's look at single sex institutions. Let's look at historically black colleges and universities. Let's look at schools that have test optional or test flexible. These are all terms that my students understand because I've been talking about them every time I meet with them because every student has a right fit. And there are more than 3,000 colleges and universities in the United States. Some are more affordable than others. Some colleges, even if you get in, just because you're not a resident of that state, it's not going to be affordable. So my students aren't skeptical at all about test option. As far as the national landscape goes, a lot of people are skeptical about test optional. Sure. Companies are pushing kids to go and test even if it means them driving two and three hours. My students don't have the means to do that. So you have to take an approach where everybody's on the same level field and you have to trust that the folks on the college admission side are gonna do their due diligence, are gonna get the proper training, understand how that admission works and hopefully they've reached out to some of the colleges and universities that have been test optional for years and pick their brain to see what happens in their office and how they use test optional admissions. Absolutely. Now, you're, you're hinting at something that's very important here, and that is a, a connection with the personnel on college and university campuses and, and, and being able to call upon them for information. Now, historically, you know, colleges would be ever present on your campus right now, visiting the representatives would be there, there would be college nights, college fairs, open houses on college campuses, and I would imagine your kids would be invited to fly in programs on college campuses. That stopped. Yep. I mean, with the coronavirus, that's just stopped. So how are you finding the access that you and your students might have to colleges and the people who are making decisions at colleges and recruiting right now? I would say there's three things. I'm gonna start at the school level, I'm gonna talk about the district level, and then I'm gonna go on into the national level. So at the school level, I've been able, through SCORE, through the calendar function, I've been able to host virtual visits during lunchtime and it's open up to my seniors and my juniors who want to come in during their lunch through Zoom and they want to listen to a college admission, undergraduate admission visit. All the colleges need to do is register on SCORE and then they can see my calendar and see what dates are available. So my students have been getting the access to colleges through that. In the district, I was a part over the summer cap advisor group in which we wanted to make October our college month. Usually in October, the majority of the public high schools in Miami-Dade County Public Schools have their college fair, which coincides with the NACAC college fair. So you have a lot of folks down here already in South Florida who are here for the national college fair, but they'll go to the school fairs as well. What our group wanted to do is we wanted to host a month of webinars and presentations. We've had all 12 state universities present for one meeting. We've had FAFSA presentations. We've had a historically black college and university presentation. We did a score presentation with all of the students at Miami-Dade County Public Schools who wanted to go. All of these events were evening events. All of the events were recorded. 
and they're sent to the college advisors at the school so that they can then disseminate that information to the students. I've disseminated it through SCORE, through the drive function in each student's profile. Then on a national level, you know, students, it's hard to find the right fit when you can't do those fly-ins, but there are virtual visits. There are virtual weekends that students still need to apply to. I give my students a lot of different resources, especially on YouTube. You can see virtually what the campus looks like. On SCORE, there's the you visit function. So if you type in a university name, the student can click on it and they can get to learn the campus. Also connecting students with alumni who are at some of these colleges has also been a way to connect these students. I think that there are a lot of positives that can come out of going through this pandemic as far as educating students about college admissions. And it's just things we can add to our toolbox to help students make the decision about where they're going to apply and then in the spring where they're going to. Obviously, you're never going to be able to replicate getting on a, on a flight, going to that college, and being on that college campus for two evenings. That's never going to change. But you have to be able to find other ways. And I think it makes it equitable for all students to use all of these features and use all of these resources to really figure out where they, they feel like they're going to fit in. Sure. Uh, excellent. Now, we've been focusing for the most part in our conversation right now about the student and the student engagement in this process, but the pandemic has had a real impact on the financial aspect of, of the college going process. Uh, how are you dealing with parents and are, are you hearing from many parents about their uncomfortability, if you will, regarding the ability to, to make choices about college and make cost and affordability choices about college right now? I haven't had that conversation a lot with students because my school is a title one school where about 70 to 70 percent of the students are on free or reduced lunch i would mm -hmm. say two out of three students are first generation students so those conversations aren't very frequent in the conversations i have had you know i've told the student the student and the parent that you have to apply to schools that are going to give you the highest amount of merit aid because need-based aid is not going to help you if you have such a, a high EFC and you can't pay that much. So getting our state scholarship like Bright Future, using micro scholarships such as Raise Me, and applying to schools and making sure that you have the best application by that specific deadline is the best way to combat the need to pay for college. I think that you have to apply smartly. You need to think about what colleges are the most affordable that are going to offer you every single thing you are looking for. And there are a lot of colleges that can do that. You know, and I tell a lot of these students, you know, once you get into a college, the college doesn't, where you go to college doesn't make or break what you're going to study. It's what you do at the college that is most important. Um, just going to a highly selective college doesn't mean that you're going to be sitting on easy street for the rest of your life. You have to go to the college and you have to make the best of that experience. And the best experience may be a local college for you. The best experience mm -hmm. may be a college that is a couple hours away or is a flight away. But every student is different. How are you and your colleagues working with the student applications this year in terms of framing for the colleges the response at Jose Marti to the pandemic. In other words, your kids have been dealing with a different kind of instructional experience. I would imagine perhaps in the spring uh, when things started to break out, it felt like a big fire drill that uh, never finished. And now things are probably a little bit more organized, but through your letters of recommendation profile that you submit to the college, how are you kind of packaging that with the, for the student's benefit. So Peter, exactly what you said. My school profile is invaluable right now because that is an opportunity for the counselor to make sure that they can put what has happened in context for the college admissions officer who is reading the application. Secondly, I've advised every student on the common application to answer that question about COVID-19 
about how it has impacted their education. And then those students who haven't been able to get the classes that they want, I feel as a counselor, I have to include that information in their letter of recommendation. That way I'm crossing off all the boxes where an undergraduate admissions rep would check for the information and to make sure that it doesn't get missed or there isn't an oversight on their part. Very good. And, and I think that that's important for kids to know too, because there's probably a lot of angst on the part of the student and the parent, but you know, my life has been greatly disrupted. My academic world has been disrupted. Well, colleges know. And of course, when, when you live in the bubble of, of your own high school and your own experience, you don't realize that this is something that affects everyone. So your, your good words are, are very supportive then too. You, you hinted at the common application in the essay. When I talked with deans of admission this last spring uh, about essays, I said, it, I suspect you're, you're preparing yourself for a lot of coronavirus essays. And they would all chuckle and they say, yes, but that's okay. Uh, and, and they said that that's an opportunity for students to reflect on something that's really been a part of their lives. How are your kids approaching that essay part? Because in the absence of maybe testing and the importance of some of the objective things in the application. Now colleges will look more critically at the subjective parts of the application and the way students present themselves uh, rather holistically. So are, are they getting their arms around their essays and the, the messaging of their application? So my advice to students is every part of an application is an opportunity for you to say something about yourself. Don't repeat yourself. If you're talking about extracurricular activities, don't be repetitive about it on your essay. I think with the opportunity to talk about how the pandemic has affected you already in a question, I don't think you should use the personal statement to write about that. So I've given that advice to my students throughout the spring. There were many free resources. Many reputable essay companies were offering free classes and I was getting those emails and I was sending them to my students, I created a resource list as far as what to write about, what not to write about, tips from all of these different companies and colleges who have blogs as well. Um, Johns Hopkins has one, Northwestern has, University of Chicago. All of these colleges have advice. And from what I've seen and what I've heard in my discussions with students, I haven't seen a whole lot of essays about COVID-19. That personal statement, you want to add nuance to yourself. You want to showcase something that cannot be found anywhere else in the application. Likewise, as a individual who writes a lot of letters of recommendation, I don't want to repeat what's in the letter of recommendation from the teachers or in the essay. So I ask my kids, who's write, writing your letter of recommendation? And when they tell me that teacher, I'm like, okay, I scratch out. I'm going to write about this club or this project that you did because I'm pretty sure that individual is gonna cover it. So it's about adding more to you. It's about that admission officer getting to know who you are and more importantly, picturing what type of student you're gonna be on their campus. Because at the end of the day, college admission officers, they're looking for reasons to admit you, not to reject you. Well, and I think you just hit something very important. What kind of a student will you be on their campus? Because I think that that, that notion of character and citizenship is going to be very important that sense of ability to demonstrate purpose is gonna be very important. So your advice is spot on as far as I'm concerned. That's good job. A quick question about the applications now because early fall is a time when you, you probably deal with a lot of kids who wanna apply early, early decision, early action. How is that fitting into the conversation this year? Because frankly, early decision means you really have to vet these schools pretty thoroughly before you, you, you make that commitment. And now it's hard to do that. I, so I give this analogy about early decision, early action. If you decide to apply early action and the college says yes, that means you're dating. If you apply through early decision and the college says yes, that means you're married. Now, do all marriages work out? No. So sometimes when you do early decision and you get the financial aid package, if that financial aid package is gonna create a burden on not on the family to pay, you can do a financial aid appeal. Over the years, I've helped students craft a financial aid appeal. Sometimes they get offered more money, sometimes they don't. In my experience, the colleges and universities have understood 
in the cases where it's a financial burden that the kid can't pay it and there's no harm, no foul. And I give them a courtesy call and I let them know what they have. And it hasn't been a very toxic conversation. They completely understand. I think that early decision and early action has a lot of benefits to students who know that this is the right school. I think that applying early really sets the tone for the student as far as their senior year because they're already on it. They're hitting the ground running. They're not only applying to college, but they're more focused. I think that the, the longer a student waits to apply to school, that sense of urgency starts to leave and it starts to trickle in everywhere. And that's how you develop the symptoms of senioritis. I think that students who have the conversation about applying early always have to have the conversation about finances. You cannot have a conversation about early decision without finances. In my school, we've developed a protocol in which if a student wants to apply early decision, we have to have a meeting with that parent and the student present so that the parent understands what early decision means and what can happen if the student gets that admitted. That means they can't look at other um, financial aid packages. It doesn't matter if the parent doesn't want them to leave. You had this conversation with me and you understood the ramifications of applying through early decision. I believe that early decision is not for all students, but I do think it gives the student the best opportunity to get admitted. Although the undergraduate, undergraduate admission folks will say, well, it really doesn't because we're gonna look at the application the same way. I'm looking at it with statistics. And statistically speaking, you're admitting a larger percentage of students through early decision and early action than you are through regular decision. That's very good. All great insight. And, and I, I hope that a lot of families get to hear what you have to say today, because this is, this is really good guidance for them. As we wrap things up, though, Jonathan, I, I'm wondering if, if you might kind of reflect for just a moment. What would you say to this 16, 17-year-old who is coming into this process, first generation to college, has perhaps some notion of what college is all about, but now because of the pandemic finds that, that again, the, the support systems that he or she might have anticipated are there, but they're not in the way they were imagined. And there's a fear, there's a, an apprehension that this isn't going to work out the way I had hoped it to work out. What advice would you give for that young person? I would say, first off, that although everything is topsy-turvy, applying to college has not changed. It's still the same that it was last year as it was five years ago, maybe not 20 because with the um, introduction of technology, it's made it even easier to apply to college. I would say, really think about what is important to you. If staying close to your family is important to you, don't feel like you have to go away to college because everybody else is. College is an individual moment in every student's life. I feel that the college process is one of the most American things a student goes through. It's a rite of passage. You have to be excited, but there's some angst in it. And if there's no angst in applying to college, then applying to college is not that important to you. You have to feel like this is your time to really decide how you want to define the next four years of your life. I think the college process and going to college are shaping students in ways they would never think. It's gonna change how you think. It's gonna open up your eyes to other cultures, to other peoples, because right now you've only been surrounded by your peers and your parents. And once you go away to college, you're gonna be dealing with a whole slew of things that you never thought you would be dealing with. I think that going into the college process, if you're 15, 16, or 17 years old, you don't have to worry about it right now. Just do your job, go to school, get the best education you can, and then when it's time to apply, have that relationship with your counselors, have that relationship with your teachers, and ask them questions because they have gone through the college process and they can help you. Wow, see the, see the possibilities then and have hope that things will work out for you. That, that's great advice, so thank you very much. I'm delighted today that we've been able to have Jonathan join us uh, to talk about the college going process 
at Jose Marti Mast, 6 to 12 Academy in Dade County, Florida. I hope you've been able to, to gain an awful lot, as much as I have from this conversation, and that you'll check in with us again for future conversations with college advisors. For now, though, thank you, Jonathan. And to those of you who have been listening, have a great day and be safe. Take care.